Okay, welcome everyone to uh, our latest event at the Global Research Network. The, uh, my name is Yuriko Otomo, I'm the director here, and I'm joined today with, with um, Preeti, who's our creative director. <laughs> Hello everyone. <laughs> Uh, and we're, we're really delighted to, to be hosting this exciting event. We're a home away from home for early career scholars around the world, as well as PhD students and independent scholars, uh, and supported by wonderful academics around the world. Um, we do a whole range of things, uh, including running workshops, events. Uh, our members run a, a think tank that is very public policy oriented and more. So have a look at our website, www.grn.global, if you'd like to find out more and if you're interested in joining. Um, I'm going to hand over to YL, who's been organizing this event to introduce our fantastic speakers. Over to you. Thank you, Yuriko, and welcome everyone to today's roundtable on digital poverty and cashless societies. Um, I'm very happy to host you all and to host our amazing guests. Uh, my name is Wala Sayer, and I'm the junior fellow at the Global Research Network and the lead for the International Trade, Investment, and Global Governance Think Tank program. Uh, one of the many things that we look into here at the Global Research Network, and in particular in our think tank program, is the digital transformation in the financial sector and um, how it could affect um, disfranchised members of the society. And so, um, especially during the wake of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, our over-reliance on technology has highlighted this problem even more, uh, the problem of digital poverty. And so we wanted to look at what kind of solutions are available and how we can combat digital poverty. Um, we wanted to see what are the role of governments, um, institutions, financial institutions, and us as individuals as well. And so today uh, we are hosting amazing guests. We're hosting uh, Chantal Maritz from uh, PwC. She is a partner in strategy, uh, strategy and a part of the PwC Consulting Network. Um, she, she has extensive experience with more than 20 years of experience in the area of digital, transforma uh, digital transformation. Um, she's advised central banks, banks, and uh, fintechs on uh, issues related to financial services and regulatory change. We are also, uh, we're also hosting uh, Alexander Stengel, who is the senior lecturer in um, sociology at Nui Galloway. Um, he is an affiliate at a number of international organizations, including the Paris Institute uh, for uh, Critical Thinking. He has authored numerous research projects and books, including one on the digital coloniality of power. And so I think the best way to kickstart our event for today is to look at cashless societies and whether we are edging towards a purely cashless societies or not. What do you think, Chantal? Hi, everyone. It's an interesting topic to think about cashless society. So I always find if you want to make a comment about something, you always bring it back home and you think, how do I feel about it? So I'm based in South Africa. And one of the key things that we are facing is we are not a cashless society. And if you look globally at cashless societies and their expansion, there is a commonality and there is a linkage between digital poverty and cashless societies. There's this digital divide that is being created. And it's important to actually step back and think, what problem are we really solving for? Are we solving for digitization? Are we solving for this new technology? But in Africa, we're solving for inclusivity. We're solving for financial inclusion. So digital financial inclusion is one of the elements that needs to come into play. And I really look forward to the discussion today because it is something I live every day. I'm busy on a program that has been run out of South Africa, a massive program where we're looking at addressing digital financial inclusion to actually help the people to move along the curve. But it's not just the banks. So yes, financial services are usually the market leaders that actually inject the funds. But actually, by governments, as citizens, as responsible corporates, we all have to play a role. And contributing to this is actually what will solve this problem. So it's a, a vast collaboration amongst a lot of parties that actually does. So looking forward to getting to, to the details of this, but I do think digital poverty and cashless societies are very interlinked. What about you, Alex? What do you think?
Um, Alex, you're muted. That, yes, yes, it's it's it took a moment. It took a moment. So <laughs> you know, uh, to to register that I had clicked. Um, so I th I think looking at your own, you know, position uh, where you're at geographically in time, socially is is a really excellent start. I think it's a it's it's what we should do. And um, I would say that um, being in a sense privileged and therefore looking at this from from privilege as a a person who lives in Europe, um, there is a lot that we don't see how much to a degree we take for granted uh, in our daily operations that is cashless. Um, and at the same time, we often overlook uh, people who are suffering from that um, and from the, from the ways that um, organizations, governments, companies can also abuse that. Um, there were certainly issues discussed, and we will probably come back to that, uh, about the uh, United States of America, where, where social services uh, and cash payouts are connected uh, to, to digitalization. So how you can control poor people, like how much uh, they're allowed uh, to, to use in money and even uh, penalized if they are trying to spend more than the government or the public allows them to have or things they should have. And um, there is certainly a push to increase, therefore, um, cashlessness uh, by certain uh, parties who are not only doing this for ideological reasons, but who can also profit uh, of it. Um, I think we should also talk about um, how a faith in, in cashless money and digitalization in, in uh, monetization uh, leads to people establish unmonitored systems of mm -hmm. exchange, which which can which I don't even mean just in a sinister way, uh, where it's like, oh, you know, terrorists and arms dealers or whatnot, but also allowing uh, people to establish maybe local forms of exchange that are based on more traditional uh, ideas of gift exchange, of uh, more traditional forms of local economies where, where people can exchange goods more directly. So I could see how this could uh, also uh, enter into a form of very generative and productive resistance to certain hyper-capitalist regimes that are certainly fueling the digitalization of money and therefore fueling uh, a digital poverty, which leads me also to, to say one thing. When we say digital poverty, this has at least two forms. One is that people are poor in a digital sense, and the other is that digitalization increases the traditional and uh, established forms of poverty. So my previous work on digital power was largely an, on like, how forms of inequality and injustice that have pre-existed uh, before digitalization are rather intensified by digitalization. So that uh, a bit of a provocative thesis from, from my end has been like the kind of inequality that is produced by digitalization is nothing new under the sun, right? This is very true. And the thing is, if we look at uh, digital poverty in, in, in term as it is, um, it may not necessarily just be in accessibility to technology. It could be also the structure, the, the, tech, the tech infrastructure that exists in a, in a, in a particular uh, geographical location. And not only that, but also we may have some segments of the society who don't necessarily understand how to use these technological solutions. The elderly people may not necessarily know how to use these solutions or conduct their businesses, their, their banking businesses. And so do you think that this would have an effect on the provision of the financial services digitally if we're talking about segments of the society that don't necessarily know how to use uh, these, these tech solutions. What do you think, Chantal? I do think it's important to define what is digital capital. So if you sit and you think is digital capital the education, so is it a very advanced um, community that actually has all the infrastructure, the di digital capital is really from a tech perspective is there. However, mm -hmm. the education is lacking. So 
So obviously from a European perspective, Alex would be the best person to give insights. But we took these things into consideration. As I mentioned, we're busy with this big transformation in South Africa, and we've been on this journey since 2019. In 2019, we actually took the, the financial services sector, a subset of it went on a study tour. So we went to Southeast Asia, we went to India, we went to Singapore, China and Thailand to see how these emerging economies, how they handled it. Because our economy, if you think of digital capital, you sit and think, okay, about the consumer and the education. So that was a factor that influenced it. But also from an infrastructure perspective, South Africa network coverage, just mobile devices, feature phones versus smartphones. So there was a lot of things that was lacking in the country. And if you sit and think how other countries embarked on this journey and how they addressed it, there was almost a digital stack or a tech stack to enable them to, to embark on this journey. So the first thing, there was always a form of digital identity. So that verification and to know proof of life, is this the person that I'm... I am speaking to, how do you verify that? And, and there's a whole example about grant payments or you know, relief or fund payments, and particularly in COVID that, that um, came out, we can talk about that. But, but if you think of this digital stack, the one is digital identity. The other one is access to funds. So you need to let funds flow. So it was always this instant payments, and this is particularly where financial services comes into play. It's that interlinkage. And then the last component, component is actually the regulatory construct. You need to an, have an enabling environment, a trusted enabling environment. Otherwise, fraud happens. The traditional players need to play, but you need to get innovation in, the fintechs in. You need to unlock this SMME market in order to enable this whole digital flow of funds. But, but we can unpack all of these components, but fundamentally, there's always been a driving force behind it. You need the tech. India, the government drove it. Um, Thailand, the banking association. So you always have a big body with multitudes of people that invest in this technology. And in South Africa, there's Banks of Africa who's driving this, and they are looking at this technology and how they can implement it. But it can't work alone. You need the connectivity. So it's the government, the telcos. And yes, I could go on forever. So I'm not going to, to spend the whole time talking about this. But, but I do think as much as it is about education and pulling people together, there has to be investment. Someone's got to pay for it. But ultimately, it creates GDP growth. And once there's growth, it just has phenomenal results for citizens and for a country. You've mentioned an important um element here, which is an, a regulatory enabling environment. So how would you describe that environment to be? What is an enabling regulatory environment to you? So people think of regulators and they're always like, they've got the stick, they're here to sort people out, but, but they're there to actually protect and to create that, that stability in the country. If you think these systemic failures in financial services, what it does, it just, the economics around it, the ripple effect is, is crazy. But, but financial services has been a cornerstone over centuries, you know, just enabling these investments. It's about the stability of consumers. As soon as the people that have the money, how they can exchange it. But what is a friendly um, regulatory environment? It's an open environment. It is not a risky environment. At the moment in South Africa, we're also busy with some um, advancements there. If you think in globally, different banking licenses are introduced. It depends on the risk you bring to the system is what the, the kind of appetite the regulators have for it. So ultimately, it's not opening everything. It's about innovating, creating a competitive landscape, and it's about consultation. Those days of arms length regulators has passed. You still need to have the, the guidance in place, but it's about collaborating with industry and saying, what can we do to open the environment, to create safety, but to actually achieve our larger objectives? So, so the regulatory landscape is really changing globally, which is fantastic to see. Alex, what about you? What do you think? Okay, so, um, I mean, when we talk about uh, the tech 
connected service providers. Then there is on the one hand, of course, the, I would say, direct finance service providers, which I think uh, we have talked a lot about so far. But I mean, also service providers uh, in, in more general sense, including government service providers. Um, and I mean, how, the question is, how do we regulate access? How do they connect? Um, just to give a example again from my European and personal experience, uh, point of view. Most recently, when I moved to Ireland, and um, just such a simple thing as uh, getting a bank account through which you then can access a lot of services like electricity was uh, a several weeks uh, long and really torturous process uh, because the bank wanted uh, certain kinds of documents which you could only, uh, which you needed to apply for digitally, and you could not progress in in their uh, digital infrastructure unless you provided them, but you could only get certain you know, documents if you already had an Irish bank account. Because even uh, despite the fact that um, when you have an IBAN account somewhere in Europe, um, there is a kind of I, called IBAN discrimination, which is kind of ridiculous if you think of how the word discrimination is usually used, but within Europe, there's an IBAN discrimination. So you, you can have an account in Belgium, an account in the UK and in Germany, but still not just get a, a bank account in Ireland, which you need for all other kinds of things, which would get you that bank account. And that is me as a European citizen. Uh, so I shudder to think what happens if you are a citizen from a country in, in Africa or in Asia or South America coming to Europe and trying to, you know, uh, get a bank account here, try to move to this country, Re regardless of your actual immigration status, that is nearly, it's made nearly impossible at first. Um, just thinking about these kinds of things and then from there on forward accessing government services if you need them, healthcare services if, if you need them. So one issue is here with the technology uh, being fairly, fairly inflexible, but at the same time it leads to removal of human workers. So, so I mean, one of the ideas that people have is if we if we have a digital infrastructure for that, we have a lot of control, obviously, so we have no, no rogue bank workers who would just sign somebody up for a bank account. But the more this becomes then therefore automized, the less people are needed. So, so these, these jobs will disappear. So, so that is certainly something where I feel like the more we have tech-centered services that are provided, not, not only is there the aspect of like how much power that gives uh, people over, over people's information on the one hand and how much access to these services can be even more strictly regulated and therefore include more discrimination, not just by IBAN, but uh, by, by, by gender, by, by ethnicity, by religion, uh, by, by job. I just want to uh, bring up the discussion about the restrictions on, le on, on legal sex work in the United States. You know, we, I mean, regardless whether you have a moral concern or not about sex work, but um, if you're a person who knows that, I mean, sex work is also work for, for sex workers to be denied uh, access to, to the use of certain, certain bank services, to PayPal or MasterCard services, even though in the, in the US it is in many, in some states, perfectly legal to do this kind of work. I mean, that is outrageous. So you can see how um, ideology can be used to deny people services using uh, technological so provide, technologically provided services. Um, so I find that highly problematic and it needs to be uh, be talked about. And the, again, the removal of jobs. And that leads me also to something where I think a big disagreement between us might lie, um, namely when it was mentioned that, oh, these services, et cetera, et cetera, will lead to more GDP growth. And that is ultimately good. And I mean, there's a whole discussion and, and rightfully so with good arguments and good Good, uh, good studies being done, that GDP growth is not necessarily leading to prosperity and better, better uh, welfare and better provision for people. Um, so, so I think that is something we need, uh, we, we would need also uh, to discuss in, in that, because um, we can generate a lot of growth uh, through digital means, which never translates into the quote unquote real world. You brought a couple of important points. Um, one of them is basically how easy it should be, how technology should actually be easing our lives uh, rather than making things a little bit more complicated than they are uh, from your own personal experience. And at the same time, you've brought another point, which is 
how in specific countries um, there are segments of the society who are conducting different types of works. They don't have access to digital banking solutions. And so it is a rather funny situation where digital financial solutions are meant to be solving a problem that exists in non-digital financial and non-digital financial world. However, it is contributing more to the problem, it seems. So don't you think then regulators op, uh, are ought to have a more lenient approach in that respect then, and rather than have a proper regulatory framework where a regulator comes and enforces and uh, defines every single aspect of the financial sector, of the digital financial sector, rather than doing that approach, don't you think that perhaps leaving it open and having a deregulation movement is a much better approach in the digital financial sector and leaving it up to the industry to decide? I don't know if Alex is going to jump in, um, but I, I have a comment around that. I think there's a few things, and I also want to respond to some of Alex's comments because any, there's always market forces. So market mm. forces do um, dictate, and you see it's, it's all the basic econ economics about supply and demand, but I, you cannot leave anything unregulated. So, so when, and that's just my, my personal opinion, I think overregulation stifles innovation. You need to remember that, but, but there's always those who are looking for the opportunity to defraud a system or to actually just look at things. Even Alex was talking about data and what people can do and that just from a diversity perspective and victimization, but you have to look at things. You can't take one view on everything. You have to look at it in context of the country that you're also operating within and all the factors. I fully agree with Alex where he mentioned you cannot use GDP growth as, for example, the only indicator. No, it's not the only indicator. It's a indicator. And it's an A indicator that would work with policymakers, for example. Certain policymakers are looking at numbers where others are looking at quality of life. But when you're talking about survival, and I want to give an example of it because then just to make it real is that in South Africa, um, I don't know if everyone was aware, but in last year there was riots happening and there was, um, there was a lot of bad things that happened and the ATMs were bombed and the malls were stripped. And it happened at the time that the grant payments, so the subsidies to the people who needed most during times of COVID, it happened then. So basically, they weren't digitally financially included in the economy. So they were dependent on the physical cash disbursements. However, with the ATM infrastructure that had blown up, the suppliers been blown up, these people didn't have money, they didn't have food. So as much as we need to take a balanced approach to these things, we need to also remember that digital inclusion is starting to be a basic human right. It's about what do people need? And for every kind of basic human rights, there's a constitution or there's kind of regulation to make sure that people protect the people who can't protect themselves. So I just wanted to bring that in context and say, you can go over to the bad, bad side and lots of things. You have to take a balanced view. And as citizens and as corporates, as PwC, we are trying to be responsible citizens to try and solve important problems and say, what more can we do to contribute? And those are the kind of things that everyone needs to do. You know, we're all people and we all need to look at basic human rights. So, so that was just some of the things I just wanted to add on. But back to you, Alex, I don't know if there's anything you want to jump on and add on to that. Well, I mean, I would bring in at, at least one, one important aspect, which is that um, when it comes to regulation, some of it happens actually, as I think you're absolutely right to say, on the national level. And um, there we can talk about like how much or how little of it is too much or too many um, or where is it best, where, where do you best regulate and where is it good to stay out? And I think it's really sectorially different. But the other part is um, what we could call the transnational aspect of this, more than even just the international one, but the transnational one, because there's transnationally uh, operating uh, forces. 
Um, there are, I, I mean, MasterCard, for example, is, is global, right? So they can globally dictate uh, certain kind of access to services and they can deal, they can deal with countries differently uh, whether or not they comply with their standards. The same with um, certain kinds of social platforms. If, if any of you are familiar with the uh, platform Twitch, which is used by a lot of gamers for streaming, but therefore also through their live streams generate through PayPal. And uh, Twitch is owned by Amazon. And they have in the past, uh, through, through accidents, sometimes not paid out uh, certain people. And, it, and it's really hard for, for, for people who are not like super famous to, uh, to get the attention uh, of the company so that they can rectify this. But they often depend on that income. And furthermore, um, th there is the copyright question, for example, if you are having have music or, or something in the background, which is even for global streaming regulated by the US American uh, DMCA. So you can be a streamer in Korea or South Africa and if you are on Twitch. And you uh, you play music, you will get a copyright strike, which can uh, you know get you off stream for an indefinite amount of time, losing you income um, by an American law. So here you have an international question uh, and a transnational question with with places uh, with, with companies like PayPal and, and, and Mastercard in 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 one area, and it becomes extremely complicated. But regulating on a transnational level is, is one of the most, most difficult questions of our time, right? And I don't think there's a lot of people who have a really good idea how we get, how we get this done. I know a couple of people who are working on this, uh, who work as lawyers and adjudicators who have experience, especially not in the digital, but in the, in the mining and fishery sector, um, where you have a lot of conflict. And, even, and, and there already you, you can see how impossible it is to regulate it. And I think Yoriko wants to chime in because I see her hand up and she has a lot of experience with law. Oh, hi, sorry, this, this isn't about Twitch, <laughs> but a more general question um, that I've been really concerned about and that's undocumented people. And so people who don't have um, a birth certificate, for example, or whose documents aren't recognized by a given government. And I wonder from a policy perspective, Alex or Chantal, whether you know um, what what sort of things should be or could be done um, about that to secure their their digital their inclusion into a digital economy, if that's the way the world is going. Um, and I ask on behalf of uh, a lot of our members of the of the Global Research Network who are interested in in campaigning or advocating for for people who are sort of traditionally excluded from, from global economies. That's one of the fundamental challenges we're busy addressing also. We, we're trying to solve for it. So I'm not saying addressing because we've got the answer, but, but one of the, the programs we're also running is that digital identity, which I mentioned, and um, what being part of that digital stack. And there is a component of the people that are documented getting them into the system and digitizing. But that's not what we're talking about. That, that is a massive component. But in South Africa and across Africa, and it's what we also saw in, in other economies, is that is a big component on education and access. How do you get people into the system? So the biggest way that happened is incentivization. Incentivization in other countries, get governments involved, but you actually make it mandatory so you almost first have to open up the system you first you can't just sit there and say well if you're not documented you can't be you need to have a period that you open it up and you say we are going to the communities we're going to the rural areas they're people that have never had a birth certificate never had a marriage certificate don't even know what it is can't even read or write so there's a massive component about user education and also providing the infrastructure to enable the capturing of it. In India, they used devices. So they went through to these communities. They had big drives about into these communities who'd never seen people and said, or other people from cities, this is what we're doing. This is how we're documenting you. And this is how we're taking you into the system. Is there one answer for all of it? No. Are we looking at various mechanisms and interventions? Yes. 
it is country specific, but you do need to, that is one of the key problems you need to solve first, include the people into the system. And then it's that continuous proof of life because once they're included in the system, there's proof of residence, then proof of life if they do need to get the grant payment. So, so those are just some of the practical things we're grappling with at the moment. And if we've got the 100 dollar um, answer for you uh, one day I will come and tell you this is the silver bullet that will solve it but but we are trying to solve that at the moment with various interventions across the board. Alex I don't know if you've got any practical examples you want to add. Um, so yeah I, I, there's there's two two things I had in mind quite quickly and I mean, the first one was, and, and, and this is really uh, something where we have to talk about cultural biases. Um, I recall, and, and uh, there's something I needed to learn, and I actually learned this from my students through discussions. Uh, I was teaching international students in Germany for a while. Um, when it came uh, to, to refugees and, and a typical stereotype that a lot of Germans have is, oh, you have these people, they have several identities and, you know, that's why they're cheaters. Um, and it is, however, such a, such a uh, you know, cultural bias because in, in Europe we have a specific tradition of what is an identity and how do you document your identity and how much is a single name and a single type of document identical with your identity and this is not the same everywhere around the world uh sometimes for or, or, or protection aspects people have in some countries uh because they belong to ethnic or religious mi uh, minority to passports to to document uh, to, to documents of identification etc etc there could be several other reasons having to do with uh, family lineage etc etc um, different documentation and filing systems in a country and, and also time that it takes, for example, to register a marriage um, and so on and so on. Also questions of like what kinds of partnerships are officially recognized in some countries and not in others. So if you think about these things, first of all, you need to work uh, to have people at least have a bit more understanding before they reject some, some form of identification or differences in how, how people handle that, especially when people have more than one form of identification. So this is, this is uh, something where we need to maybe do some kind of old fashioned black work, right? Uh, with people and say so like so you need to understand and this is something where we need to have com maybe community organizers work with the communities where refugees and immigrants are coming in uh, to to help them understand that the other side however is and here it gets a bit tricky uh, I uh, know that uh, the American uh, US American social researcher Virginia Eubanks has researched uh, this quite well with regard to digital uh, access to services um, where she has been working, I think about a good decade ago with people from the local WMCA uh, who were offering to, to women uh, courses on uh, digitalization so that they could access services, people who were considered poor. And therefore people thought, well, they do not have the right digital literacy to use and access these services. They just need the motivation and they just need the, the competency. But it turns out that these people uh, often had previously before they, for example, were unemployed, had jobs where they use digital tools on an everyday basis. So and the big surprise then is, so why wouldn't they use, uh, you know, digital registering systems for healthcare, for, for, for social welfare, et cetera, et cetera. And that was because there was a, an experience people had data could be abused by governance and by powerful forces. So they were actively resisting uh, using these systems. So it is not only that we need to motivate people, it is not only that we need to give them the skills. So, so there is a couple of other factors uh, in, in play, why they are actually not just not motivated, but actually uh, resisting using these systems. And it is not simply working to overcome the resistance, but get to the root of the resistance and change uh, something in, in, in the culture uh, of the providers, right? That creates that untrustworthiness. Um, and I think that is really the hard work over the long term, right? Um, 
you know, for, for some, they believe that um, the um, um, going into non-traditional digital financial services through um, areas like Bitcoin, for example, could be a good solution for them to evade such problems, especially in terms of security. But do you think that this would be perhaps a way for us to try to convince people and give them more assurity that, all right, using decentralized financial solutions is already using a technological solution. Perhaps this could provide you some sort of assurity that becoming include, included in the digital world, in the traditional digital financial sectors, would be a more suitable option for you and would provide you with better access and with better solutions. Don't you think that this would be a viable way to, to navigate people who have fear from sharing their data? So I have my opinion, um, and Alex, please jump in too. I, I think it, it's solving different problems. So when people are tech averse, these certain things, if they are tech averse, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's traditional financial services, that's, that is something. But the factor is trust. And it's exactly what Alex was talking about. So we've also seen in our research that we've done that trust is the major factor. So as much as there's innovation, as much as there's lots of things happening in, in financial services, people trust the traditional profile of a person usually trusts their financial institution. And the new players that come in with different banking licenses, they haven't built up this trust relationships that these big financial institutions. So that's why they are going to continue to be big players and dominant players. But the fact of fraud and um, tax evasion and avoiding using the man because you want to do whatever you want to do in, 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 in the market and you don't want to be traced for that, that they will always find a way. So even in cashless societies, there's a lot of cash that still moves around for that exact reason. And that is a bigger problem that needs to be addressed. And that, that could be another um, webinar all on its own to discuss those fundamentals. We don't have the solutions for that. But I do think that people need to understand the risk associated with what kind of financial services you play in. The one factor why there is always a central bank and the fiat um, whether it's the fiat dollar, the rand, whatever you use, there's always your store of value is backed by a financial institution and there's coverage. So that builds trust in financial services. So if I'm defrauded, I can contact my bank, the central bank, there's various other things. When you get into this ethernet, when you get into Bitcoin and you look at all the kind of things that can happen, that risk factor as a person, you need to know that I'm taking that risk on myself. Maybe people like grappling in it and playing in it, but traditionally the players always tend to not, not only go Bitcoin, they will have a various factors, but that technology and what's happening there is still being explored. It's still being innovated. So, so watch the space, but I do think that trust factor drives everything. It's relationships. It's about who is accountable and who's going to protect me. So, so that's just, just a perspective. What about you, Alex? So um, before I directly answer, I mean, I, I also want to mention one side note, and that is the more we, we use these technologies, especially Bitcoin, where a lot has been written about Bitcoin mining and the, the energy it uh, might or might not uh, use up, um, you, there is an environmental and, or ecological factor to consider um, with all this technology, the energy production and consumption on the one hand, and also the, 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 the lithium mining, the rare earth mining, and then disposal of uh, used up computers and so on and so on, which often affects especially the poorer and marginalized people more. Than, than the richer ones. And, the, and it affects people in, in Africa and South America more than the people in Europe who happily first take these materials under terrible conditions out of uh, South America and, and, and Africa and Asia and then dump the waste there again. I mean, this is, a, this is a harsh, brutal and disgusting ecological reality where the ecological disaster and the human disaster are combined. So when we say Bitcoin, etc., we, we, we cannot forget that this is also a part of it. 
Now, more directly in response, um, um, I, I think, first of all, you need three types of, let's say, literacy for that. You need digital literacy, you need financial literacy, and you need digital financial literacy, which are three completely different types in order to even have a little bit of trust, which always begins with, in a sense, also understanding to some degree what is going on. So, um, and something, I mean, all cryptocurrencies uh, and the basis on black blockchain technology, et cetera, et cetera, are not easy to understand, uh, even for some people who are working in these fields, right? So it, it is not, in, in, you know, something that you, you, you learn in, in an hour by, by reading a summary or watching a 10 minute YouTube video. You won't understand it in a way that makes you say, oh yeah, yeah now I'm, you know, I, I can trust this, I understand it. Uh, it. It requires a bit of a process of learning. Um, and, and even then you will first realize that there are dangers and you will realize that there's a lot of people who do not understand how this stuff works. I mean, just the other day, I was thinking about that story, maybe you read it, that there was this, this group of uh, people who had bought uh, the NFT for, uh, or had bought one of the copies of uh, Jodorowsky's Dune book, which is an unfilmed version uh, of, the, of the Frank Herbert novel, and there's recently the new movie. So they bought this and they had the NFT for it, and then they said like, so now we own Dune, which is of course laughable. It means that they haven't, in a sense, first of all, understood what copyright is, okay? Uh, but um, here you can clearly see all of this mystification uh, uh, around it that people build, even supposedly, and it's tech, supposedly tech-savvy people from the gaming world or something who, who bought that for three million. And even they don't fully grasp all of the uh, complicated context of something like this. Um, and then you, if, if you, as a person who's just a lay person, reads these stories, you are then horrified and, and think like, uh, you know, if these people don't know what they are doing, right, then I better stay away from it, you know? For, yeah, so that is uh, maybe one of the key things is that um, we need to improve, first of all, these three types of literacy, but, you know, before we can seriously talk about using uh, cryptocurrencies to, to create more trust in, in the uh, of a service provision that they could underlie. I think Yuriko has a comment. Yeah, so thank you, Alex, for bringing in um, the environmental aspect. And I have a question for Chantal, which is um, that digital inclusion and economic growth sound wonderful, but if it's at the cost of, obviously, the conditions for life on Earth, it doesn't make any sense at all. And so I was wondering to what extent uh, financial institutions in your experience are actually taking a cross silo approach to thinking through these problems. It is a real problem. And, and actually to take it back to the basics, even in South Africa, our power stations are coal. So we've got a lot of our coal-based power stations. So, so if you think of the environment from that aspect, it's, it's a huge environmental thing. And then you sit and you think, so no, we shouldn't. So if you take the environmental aspect, and we also, we've got a lot of ESG solutions that we go to clients and we're focusing on, you know, your zero footprint and all those kind of things. But, but it's that grappling of, you know, survival and basic human rights to that of the environment. So it is, there's no clear cut answer, but ultimately it's also, it goes back down to grassroots about education. So the responsible citizens and corporates do know what they need to do. So there is massive progress with those that are more digitally wealthy, that understand the impact, they are making those changes, which is fantastic, but that cannot happen in a bubble. But you cannot also just switch off from the community where people don't have power, they don't have running water, they don't have any of that, they don't have basic housing. So, so what do you do? So you actually, there's big initiatives that are happening across Africa. And I know the World Bank has invested it um, in it and a few other organizations just about investing in the infrastructure. So a lot of countries already have the infrastructure so they can make other plans. So when you start building the basic infrastructure, build it with sustainability in mind, 
So all the, the housing that has been put up, we've got a lot of squatter camps and, and those kind of housing, informal housing, those are built with sustainability in mind, using solar power. We've got sunshine. Africa has sunshine. So we're looking at what are those things that you can leverage. And these big programs by the corporates, particularly in financial services, contributing to the ESG agenda and saying, what can we do to uplift the communities and educate? Africa is a massive thing about education. And it's, so it's a dual pronged approach, but, but it is, it's difficult. If you can imagine when you, you sit and you think um, there was some of, and I want to give an example and then I'll also hand over to Alex, but there was a lot of load shedding in our country over the last period of time. And it was during the grade 12 exams, so the matric exams, and people needed to qualify. They were in the informal settlements, but they didn't have power. And there was a massive thing about, are we going to switch off some of these coal mines? And the decision was, no, we needed it. We needed to get the power to them so that they can actually start their education, start their career. So, so I think it's a very complex problem that policymakers need to make decisions on. But education forms the key to all of it and collaboration. Alex? Yeah, I think um, that point you were making about infrastructure is, is one of the, I, I would say, like not just key points for, for my, my recent work, but also one of my, my pet peeves is that we are not really talking enough about infrastructure in this case. And that means both, I think about the hard infrastructure as well as kind of a soft infrastructure, right? I mean, a lot of it, for example, knowledge work and cultural labor, I consider uh, a kind of part of soft infrastructure, so to speak, but, all, but also the hard infrastructure. So you, you mentioned, uh, you, you know, the energy being in the, uh, produced by the traditional forms, which we cannot simply stop overnight, but we need investment in, in, in different forms. Uh, in, in more renewable and alternative forms of energy production, but also in energy efficiency, uh, where I, I don't think enough uh, research is done really, because it's always the production that is given so much focus. But I think, think efficiency and storage of energy uh, would be very important because, we, you know, in, in electricity production, we actually lose a lot of the energy that is produced because it's it's either not directly you know put into the system or it's not stored etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's there's a lot of discussion here where I'm not not the scientist enough to talk about this because this is like, you know I think a different group of scientists that you need to ask <laughs> but um, but with infrastructure I think there is a number of discussions around that and of the harder infrastructure um, and the financing of it so with energy and co in, in the last couple of weeks as uh, some funds, uh, larger funds that are pension funds, hedge funds that are affiliated, for example, with Harvard University, have been trying to divest from uh, traditional uh, energy producers. Um, there is these kind of uh, conglomerates that are trying to fight back and even create laws that prohibit people, like or groups like Harvard, from divesting I mean, the, the idea is that you restrict the freedom of investors to invest where they want, right? I mean, this is to me, absolutely, I, I, don't, I don't even know, this is an irony in a sense that, that is so stupid, but it, these are things that are really happening. But also if I got to like what, what is being financed, um, you, you have so many uh, projects, that, infrastructure projects that are utterly useless but because there are existing financing structures for them, uh, they're being financed. I just want to, want to and, and not only, but also in and through the energy sector. And I want to just point out the amazing work that an anthropologist by the name of Hannah Apple has done on this, um, which I can only recommend because it's also very accessible uh, for readers who are not specialists or large theorists. Um, and it's, and it's uh, super, super interesting. And the group of people that she's uh, uh, working with from geography and anthropology who've, who've uh, internationally uh, they've put out a lot of really good work on infrastructure, which I, I just encourage people to read because it's really great, great stuff and informative stuff. Um, and I think here again with education and bringing communities and local people and where we have where people can come together in a more you know open way where all stakeholders in an area including the businesses and 
and, and, and managers for larger uh, companies, the uh, marginalized communities, if they can come together and uh, really say what is needed, what can we do, what, how can we together maybe build smarter structures, uh, micro infrastructures where the hard and soft infrastructures in a place really come together. I think we haven't really done a lot of good work on that. And funny enough, we could use digital technologies much better to, to do this uh, as we're doing here. I mean, in, in what kind of forum uh, just a couple of years ago could two speakers like us have come together, right? It would have been, oh, the person from the investment and the person who's a researcher and how do they even meet? Why would they even go to a place for a workshop or conference together? Right. So I think that is the interesting part. If we come to this with the right attitude to say, like, OK, we, we also want to listen to each other. And I mean, we clearly come from very different points of view. Right. Um, but I have said this for, for for many years is this ideological against each other between people who think of themselves as leftist scholars or uh, you know, think of the others as oh neoliberals, etc. It's it's not this is not working forward, right? Because as you said, markets are here and they are not going to go away. So we need to we need to deal with this. You know, I mean, some form of capitalistic system will continue to exist, however much we pray for the revolution uh, in, in certain Marxist circles, but it's not going to happen. Right in in the way that you imagine, and and thankfully, because every every major revolution that has been successful in the end has turned on its own. You could look at it that way too. So we need, I think, more generative and and, and newer solutions to the problem, because as as I tried to say in my in my book, Digital Economy of Power, it's uh, the the way that the, the digital revolution happened was in a in a way that was just old patterns that reinforced the old forms of social inequality. Why? Because the old antagonisms and old ideological antagonisms were carried into it rather than searching for creative solutions. And if you look today at after COVID or with COVID at a lot of these built back better plans that people come up with, you often see that they're not, they're, they're just building back better something that is 20, 30, 40 years outdated in the mindset. It is not really a let's come together and come up with really creative solutions uh, story. Um, and, and this is what we really need to do. And this is, I always, as I always say, the GRN is an interesting forum because it invites people to come together uh, with like from different worlds who are willing to, to speak to something else and are willing to go forward in a more creative and generative way, as it should be, right? It's not, it's not about overcoming resistance. It's about sitting together and think like, how can we take this resistance and, and bring it together somewhere where we do better than we did before, like really better, you know, not just build back better, just build something new that's actually better. Eureka, you have a question. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm sorry, we're running out of time, so we'll need to wrap up in a moment. But perhaps before we go, we've got some viewers um, on our YouTube live stream at the moment. And we've got one question that we could perhaps end with uh, from Anissa Betia. And she says um, she'd like, Alex and Chantal to um, offer their comments on what they think the key things are that organizations working on digital inclusion could teach the public to increase trust in the financial literacy and digital skills. Um, yes, so your suggestion on, on things that those sorts of organizations could and should focus on. So I'll use the example of what we're doing as, as PwC. So we've actually relooked at our strategy and, and it's not just about being a corporate and what we can do for, for ourselves. It's about how to be responsible. So our key thing and our key drive is about building trust and creating sustained outcomes for our clients. So any project that we execute um, is about looking at it and what more can you do than just doing the job? So, so it's about that is the mindset. So what am I talking about? It's a cultural shift that you need to create. If we want to actually be responsible, we need to be transparent. And that is what communities and people want. At the end of the day, as this community, even on the call, we people, we like talking and working with people that we like. And we like people that are going to be transparent. So if you're going to be an organization, transparent reporting, be open about your ESG, be open about what your objectives are, what your strategy is. Because if you are more open, then there's no hidden agendas, there's no 
corruption. And, and I think those are the kind of things that you actually need to sort out. You build trust by being honest and having integrity. So yes, there can be fancy other things that you do, but fundamentals for me is about trust and integrity and transparency. Alex? So yeah, I think that, that that point about transparency is uh, is is really maybe I think you're absolutely right. One of the most important points, and um, we also need good standards. And I think this is uh, coming back to something uh, that was a question earlier, which I, uh, was the question of regulators. I think it is this question of transparency where regulators can actually do a lot uh, by holding people accountable to be transparent and. Um, maybe we can't, uh, as, as is clear, we can't regulate every, every little detail, but here I think we have a clear chance uh, of having regulators make certain demands and also deal out uh, punishments if people are not transparent. Uh, here we can have rules because they are not affecting business directly, um, but they, they regulate business in a sense uh, in dealings between people indirectly. But if we are really holding every party to a process to account here um, and, and regulators use that, uh, I think we have a good chance of making an impact. Um, so I think that's really, really great. And I think that is something that communities, organizers, activists can also uh, reasonably demand and it is really much harder for people who don't want to play uh, or play fair to deny right um, there are those who want to play fair but uh, um, sometimes see themselves in, in a world that is not regulated enough that where it matters so they so for them it's like if I don't if I do play fair I might not have a chance in the market right so 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 that is something where we need to have guarantees for for players and they're often smaller players um, to be part of these these processes and um, to to have have insight um, and to have everybody on the same uh, same playing field because it is of course uh, often with regard to taxes but I think that's a general point mentioned that uh, the, the the really big players the multi or transnational corporations are very often those that have an easier time circumventing rules because they're uh, they have an army of lawyers that a, a small or a mid-sized company does not have, right? Um, but as as we know, for, for real for real growth, including GDP, but other forms of growth as well, to happen, we we need to invest more and ha create more chances for small and mid-sized companies um, if if we want to go into this world. Because for um, the multinational huge corporations that have become the size of nation states themselves. Um, there is no, there is no real incentive um, to to invest in people, to invest in communities, um, because of the way the business is structured. Uh, we, we know all the stuff about shareholder companies and who they're really accountable to, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. We don't need to go into this uh, today, but it is very clear that the interests are very different, and so we need to work with the people. Uh, we're interested in hold the other ones, the larger ones, to to account where it matters. Right? So I think that is uh, maybe my, my my just my addition to to what has been far more eloquently uh, put by. Thank you very much, Alexander and Chantal, for this for this very insightful um, discussion. It certainly did raise more questions, and I have we had some. Some more time to discuss them. Uh, perhaps we can we can organize another um, another event in the near future to address more of these questions and to look into them. But uh, again, thank you very much for your uh, for the insights and for the contribution. Um, it was a very lovely discussion. Thank you so.